I have a right to the church's liturgy. It belongs to the entire church. So if there are problems in the church, as a baptized person, I have a responsibility. I can't just say, well, it's somebody else's problem. Jesus tells us, the harvest is great, but the laborers are few. Do not be afraid. John Paul II was big on, be not afraid. The culture is afraid. I say the same thing to the kids, because kids are afraid of everything. My name is Father Greg Labus. I'm pastor at St. Joseph Church in Edinburgh, Texas, in the lower Rio Grande Valley. I grew up in this area. Uh, all my brothers and sisters are still in this area. My parents of Polish ancestry were from here. And they, uh, when they got married uh, in the early 50s, uh, we settled here in Edinburgh and I grew up here. Actually, I'm the pastor of my home church where I grew up. So I went to St. Joseph's School which is right next door and through first through eighth grade. And now I'm pastor of the parish, which is uh, kind of an unusual thing sometimes to be, uh, grow up in an area and then come back to be pastor. So I've been here now for 12 years. I have five brothers and sisters. I'm the oldest. Uh, so I look in that direction and they look up to me some we have fun with that, uh, so uh, they all uh, live in this area, which is kind of unusual. A lot of families, uh, brothers and sisters, are scattered all over the place, but uh, all of I'm very fortunate that my brothers and sisters live uh, very close. When I was young, I, I considered being a priest when I was, I can remember, about eight years old. I thought, I want to be a priest. I was always fascinated with the liturgy. And of course, when I was growing up, the mass was all in Latin, and the priest didn't face the people, typically. It was always uh, ad orientem. So at home, when we were growing up, we played church. And my mother made a little chasuble, and I would be the priest, and I'd make little hosts out of bread. I would squish them and make sure that they're uh, nice and flat and uh, we would play church. I remember also my grandmother always was saying to me, ah, you're gonna be a priest, you're going to be a priest. And so I had thought about that when I was little, uh, that I want, that would be something that I would want to do. I was fascinated with the music of the church um, the organ is in particular, the choir. When I graduated from St. Joseph's School, I went to the public school and I was in the choral program here at Edinburgh High School. And I was blown away by the beauty of voices in singing and harmony. So I decided to pursue music education. Uh, to, I wanted to study with a particular professor who had just taken a position at the University of Oklahoma. And when I got there, they, I looked into where the parishes were, and there was a parish in honor of St. Joseph. Well, I grew up at St. Joseph's, and so it was uh, natural, I think, for me to gravitate to uh, a parish that was uh, named St. Joseph, since it was the same parish where I had grown up in. My reading of Vatican II shaped me, uh, especially the document on the sacred liturgy. I was, in a way, I came to understand a little bit better my role as a baptized 
person. The Constitution on the Sacred Liturgy says, Mother Church earnestly desires that all the faithful should be led to that full, conscious, and active participation in liturgical celebrations, which is demanded by the very nature of the liturgy to which the Christian people, a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a redeemed people have a right and obligation by reason of their baptism. I thought, I'm baptized. I have a right to the church's liturgy. It's every, it belongs to the entire church. So if there are uh, problems in the church, as a baptized person, I have a responsibility. I can't just say, well, it's somebody else's problem. No, I have to take responsibility as a member of the body of Christ. So that kind of led me down that path to continue to deepen my faith. And at the same time, that's when my desire or the thoughts of being a priest kind of resurfaced again. And in the middle of my uh, college years, I did pursue talking to the vocations director and ask him um, about seminary and what I would need to do. And he very bluntly told me, why would you want to be a priest? And that kind of took me aback. I feel, I, I told him, I said, I felt, feel like God is calling me to do this. He says, you don't really want to be a priest. And I thought, okay, maybe I don't want to be a priest. I don't know, I'm confused again. So um, I decided, well, maybe God wants me to pursue music and uh, pursue working in the church and promoting the sacred liturgy. Or at the time where I was coming to learn more and more about the reform of the sacred liturgy. I dropped the idea of priesthood and worked in a parish in Fort Worth for uh, a number of years, Holy Family Church. And I had a wonderful choir, and I can remember the first time I went uh, to Holy Family, I was impressed by the liturgy, how beautifully it was celebrated, and the music was uh, very good music and well done. So I ended up being the music director there and uh, I was there for seven years. And then uh, Bishop Gracida came to the Diocese of Corpus Christi, and he uh, wanted to uh, have a, a cathedral music program. So I was hired along with a, a classmate of mine from Fort Worth, and we were co-directors at the cathedral in Corpus Christi, developing a choral music program, which I ended up being there for 17 years as one of the music directors. But it was at that time again, in the early 90s, that the idea of priesthood resurfaced. And at that point, I had already met with the, the vocations director. I had filled out all the paperwork. I'd even met with the bishop. But I didn't, just didn't go forward and sign my name to all of it. Getting close to the Jubilee year, we had several opportunities to uh, promote. There were three years that were set aside in uh, different programs and different focuses as we led up to the Jubilee year of 2000. And it was during that time that I bought the biography of John Paul II by George Weigel, uh, A Witness to Hope. And I read his biography, and of course it was, John Paul II was Pope at the time, and I just, I was blown away by his story. That all that he went through and endured during the Nazi years, all that he endured under communism, and holding strong to faith, he was one of the fathers of the Second Vatican Council. And I was just so impressed by his biography that again, the idea of going to seminary started resurfacing. 
all during my years at the cathedral, as when I was cantering, I sat opposite a window of holy orders. The window opposite me uh, showed a bishop laying hands on a man and ordaining him to the priesthood. So I had been looking at that window for years. And in the Jubilee year of 2000, during an ordination, I was cantering at the ordination and I looked up at that window and I said, okay, you win, I'm going to do this. Up until then, I think part of the reason I didn't go forward was I was putting conditions. I think I can say that one of the reasons why I didn't pursue priesthood earlier is that I was putting conditions on, on God. I would say, well, I will do it if you allow me to continue with music. And so one of the considerations I was thinking of, well, I could stay at the cathedral and still do music, maybe permanent diaconate would be the route to go as I was trying to hold on to one thing and do something else also. I think the putting on the conditions, God did not uh, accept that. And at the ordination in 2000, when I s looked at that window and I said, all right, I will do what you want. No conditions. I'm going to let go of myself. I'm going to do your will and wherever it leads me, I'm going to trust. And that's hard, I think, for most people to just let go and to trust in God's will. And it was because it was hard for me. And when I did let go and when I said, I'm going to do what you want, Lord, and wherever it takes me, and I had no idea where this was going to go. I had some philosophy in my background, but I didn't have enough. So I was put in the pre-theology class, so it was necessary to do more philosophy. And the priest that was in charge of us, I remember him telling us when we got there, just relax, you're not being ordained tomorrow. And so, okay, we take a deep breath. So we did, uh, I thought, five years, wow. I'm 45, it's gonna be 50 before I'm ordained. If, if this goes the way I think it's gonna go, if, according to God's plan. So I thought that's gonna be a, a, a long, long time. So we kept that uh, in, in front of us, all my, my classmates I said, just relax, you're not being ordained tomorrow. And along the way, of course, my class dwindled uh, as the years went by. Out of about 28, I think nine of us were, or, were graduated from the University of St. Mary of the Lake and were ordained. The joke then was at ordination, uh, get worried, yes, we're being ordained tomorrow. We remembered what Father Gus had told us at the beginning of those five years, which by the way, those five years went by so fast, I, it was like a blink, really, five years and we're being ordained already. So I was ordained in 2006 uh, at the Basilica of Our Lady of San Juan del Valle. Uh, I was ordained by Bishop Peña. And uh, my first assignment was actually at the Basilica. I was the assistant to the rector of the Basilica. And it was a wonderful experience. Uh, Father Ortega was the rector of the Basilica at the time. I was there and then went to a, a, another parish as a parochial vicar in Harlingen. And Bishop Peña then assigned me as administrator of a small parish in Santa Rosa. I remember after six weeks, Bishop Peña came to me and he says, have you unpacked yet? And I said, well, yes. <laughs> he says, well, you get to pack again because I'm making you pastor of Our Lady of Mercy in Mercedes. So I had a brief six weeks in Santa Rosa and then went to Mercedes as pastor. I was there for almost three years. And then Bishop Flores assigned me to uh, be pastor here at St. Joseph, which while I grew up in this parish, um, Bishop said, I, I remember Bishop talking to me, he says, well, you know, you're going back to your home parish. I said, well, 
that was a long time ago when I was there. Very few people are still there that I grew up with in the parish. It's a, the makeup of the parish is totally different. And indeed it is, but uh, it was, it's been a great experience to be back here at St. Joseph. I see my role uh, primarily as uh, focusing on the celebration of the Sunday liturgies and Holy Day liturgies, that the liturgy is the primary aspect of the parish and it should be done, uh, it should be celebrated beautifully. And of course, sacred music is an integral part of the sacred liturgy as the Second Vatican Council teaches. So my music background is not gonna go to, it has not gone to waste. Uh, I have continued to be uh, active in musical, uh, church music organizations. And of course, here in the parish, I have encouraged not only uh, our organists, but uh, developing and working with cantors that uh, lead the singing. At school masses, we have a chalice in a case, and each class receives the chalice each week, and they're asked to pray for vocations to the priesthood and religious life. And so I talk to the kids periodically and I invite them to consider, Jesus tells us the harvest is great, but the laborers are few. They know that verse because I'm, I just have to start it and they know. So planting that seed with them, I talk also with my altar servers to not be afraid. You know, that was one of the things out of John Paul II. He, in, in Weigel's biography of Witness to Hope, John Paul II was big on, be not afraid. The culture is afraid. And John Paul II telling us Jesus' words, be not afraid. I say the same thing to the kids because kids are afraid of everything. Largely, young people are afraid of commitment. And so I tell them, don't be afraid. If God calls you to be a priest, don't be afraid to say yes. To the girls, if God wants you to be a religious, don't be afraid to say yes. And I said, if God is calling you to the vocation of marriage, don't be afraid to say yes. Because a lot of, of our young people are afraid. And largely, I think it's a, a fear of commitment. My journey toward priesthood was perhaps complicated, and perhaps I was afraid when I was younger. Perhaps I was confused, and I, well, I, I don't think it was perhaps, I think I was confused. And God was leading me and forming me in a way uh, that was going to help serve Him and His church. For those that are uh, perhaps in their 40s, uh, I would encourage you don't be afraid to pursue a vocation to priesthood. I was 45 when I finally made that decision and let go of myself and um, followed what God wanted to, me to do. So uh, don't be afraid to, to say yes. Now, if you're 80, that might be a little bit too old. But if you're in your 40s, uh, believe me, God can do all kinds of wonderful things with you. So, and I, I know that God is still working uh, with me. I'm a work in progress. I think all of us are works in progress. So uh, don't be discouraged. Say yes to the Lord. Let Him guide you and everything will work beautifully if you trust in God's plan for you. Lord and Savior, bless us with holy priests. Through their ministry, may your life-giving presence in the sacraments always be present in your church. Amen.